Good morning, friends. Uh, thank you all for being here today for this wonderful CME. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing in the community. Good to see so many familiar names in the chat, as well as some folks uh, from out the community joining us. So just thank you for, for being here today. Um, I'm Dr. John Stevens, one of the faculty physicians here at Swedish First Hill. And I'll be talking about um, urine toxicology, testing pearls and pitfalls, or the P's and P's of PP. <laughs> I have uh, nothing to disclose. Um, financially, uh, I do have to disclose I have the humor of a 12-year-old boy or the father of three small children. A couple of key objectives today, we're going to be talking about um, basically the goals of urine toxicology testing in the clinic setting, and also uh, common mistakes that we make uh, and misses that we make with urine toxicology testing. So to start off, why, why do we even bother screening with our, with our urine toxicology testing? Why can't we just take our patients um, at their word? Um, well, we know that there are many reasons that patients may not disclose um, what they're ingesting or what they might not even know what they're ingesting. Um, there's shame, there's stigma, there's fear of discontinuation of treatment from you, um, not wanting to disappoint you as the provider. Um, so a lot of reasons that patients may not tell you what they're, they're taking. And so this is just one more tool in our armamentarium to treat substance use disorders. Um, to think about what we're doing really at the basis level, we are looking to confirm whether patients are taking the medications we're prescribing and adjusting other things that might put them at harm based on the interactions with the medications that they are getting prescribed or just from that base risk of harm from that substance. Um, we're looking for uh, relapses and we're looking to make sure patients are compliant with a care plan so that we can best intervene on their behalf, um, trying to reduce risk of overdose and other complications and medication interactions. For our community, we're also trying to identify diversion to make sure the substances that we're prescribing are getting to our patients and they're not ending up stolen from um, medication cabinets or other places. We can also use these for our patient, again, to identify folks that are maybe running out of medications early um, because they're taking more medication than prescribed. So again, another piece of the non-adherence to our testing. After that brief whirl whirlwind run through our whys, let's talk about the winds of testing. Um, as uh, our colleagues were mentioning earlier, we don't have a lot of great data on like, this is the exact best way and timing to do your urine toxicology testing. Um, we really just have expert and societal guideline recommendations and the law to tell us what to do when we're testing things. Most of how we're doing our testing is really based on our expert um, guidelines, which is recommended to do testing at a minimum based on risk for patients. Um, there are a number of standardized tools, and you should really be using one of these tools, depending on what you're prescribing for your patients. I have uh, shown here the opioid risk tool um, for opioid use disorder. Uh, so this is for folks that if you are starting um, opioids for someone for chronic pain, or if you're assuming um, a prescription for opioids for chronic pain, it's meant to use this as a tool to identify folks that are lower risk or higher risk. Um, and there are different tools depending on which medication you're prescribing or what you're concerned about. And then once you've identified their risk of having a substance use or developing a substance use disorder um, related to that substance, you're gonna do your screen at a minimum once a year, twice a year, or thrice a year, sorry, force a year, <laughs> twice a year, uh, based on their, their risk level. <clears throat> and again, that's, that's really just based on, on expert guidance and recommendations. The reason is not to do more frequent testing or to screen, or to screen every single visit or every single prescription is that the more we do testing, the more false positives and the more false negatives that you're going to pick up that might lead to interventions that really disrupt the care of that patient. That's, that's the one big caveat to it. Um, outside of that minimum standard, there's a couple of times where you might do additional testing, and it's really should be based on specific events or reasons, not on your gestalt or feel. So folks that are um, coming in for early refills, if they're reporting lost or stolen prescriptions, um, if they appear intoxicated, like if there's a very clear indication there is something that's different that's um, it's gone off the beaten path of your care plan. Those are specific things to indicate it's time to do testing beyond just that baseline once a year, twice a year, four times a year based on risk. Um, the other side of our, beside our guideline societal recommendations is the law. So according to Washington state rules, I know we have some friends from out of state, um, so know your state codes, but there's just a couple of things that they really regulate as far as timing of toxicology screening. Um, and it's really specifically related to opioids for non-cancer chronic pain usage. For folks in the subacute phase, so that have been at opioids for six to 12 weeks um, that are having decreasing function or worsening pain, those folks should be screened in that, in that window uh, per the Washington State Code. And then when you're transitioning to the chronic state of treatment, so when folks are getting to 12 weeks or you're assuming that they're going to go beyond 12 weeks and their um, prescription of opioids for non-cancer chronic pain, get them screened at that point there per the state code. Um, it's really important to have a standard for how you're testing all patients and to test all patients the same. 
Um, there's not a lot of, a ton of studies out there, but from a larger review study from the VA uh, from the early aughts, looking at a 10 year period of new opiate prescriptions for patients for chronic pain. Um, they found that at one, three and six months of time, uh, this is comparing black patients to white patients in their population, that black patients were significantly more likely to be tested at all three time intervals. And even more disturbing were the outcomes of those testing. So looking specifically at THC and cocaine in that study, uh, black patients that tested positive for THC were more than twice as likely to have their opioids discontinued. And um, black patients testing positive for cocaine were more than three times as likely to have their opioids discontinued. So test consistently, but also make sure you're treating consistently uh, based on your testing. And the last little piece on timing is always get consent. Um, it, it, is, it can be very harmful for your patient to provide a relationship um, to go in with the result of their positive pregnancy test and start yelling at them for having a positive THC. Um, that they didn't know you were gonna be testing them for drugs. So make sure you get consent from your patient. It can be very harmful to your patient to, to not get the permission to, to chat about um, getting that urine toxicology beforehand. Uh, we have two primary tools that we're using for testing urine. Um, the reason we do urine as opposed to blood or hair or other parts of the body is that it's easy to collect, it's quick to get an office-based result, and it's pretty cost-effective. Um, the downside of it is that it's not as specific. Um, our amino assay testing that we're doing, our urine dip, it's really looking for um, seem to see if it can recognize a piece of the compound or the metabolite that it's testing for. And if something looks close enough, it's gonna show up as positive on that ear toxicology uh, screen. And also has some limited detection, which we're gonna talk about um, in the next slide. Our uh, GCMS, LCMS, so gas and liquid uh, chromatography mass spectrometry. Um, it is great because it's incredibly specific, um, but it's more expensive um, and it is a send out and it can take even a couple of weeks for that to come back. I've had a patient where the um, GCMS actually took a couple of weeks because they had to do so many serial dilutions because she had so much substance um, in her urine uh, to get an actual quantification. They just had to do multiple, multiple serial dilutions to get there. So just know that that can take time. Um, this is a GCMS at the bottom here. I have a chemistry friend who ran a um, acetaminophen tablet for me. And so there's many, many things in a substance, but each of these spikes very clearly corresponds to one particular chemical compound um, or molecule within a chemical compound. So it is incredibly specific when compared to the standard to say, yes, this is what you're looking for. And it's there. To simplify that into terms, I would understand that you're going to say that's your George Costanza squint. Yeah, that looks close enough. I think that's right. I'm going to show it positive. If you really need to know, spend the money, put on the glasses, know what you're looking at. <laughs> um, Pitfalls, we're gonna get to a couple of these and I'm not gonna run through every single table, but just to say that there are a handful of different tables that are out there that you should have somewhere in your back pocket to look at and really thinking about the timing of your patient's history versus what you're seeing on the urine tox. Does it make sense? Um, different substances tend to show up in the urine for different time windows. And it depends on what the substance is. Some of it depends on how much they're using. Um, and some of it depends on a patient's metabolism. So it's gonna be a little bit variable. <clears throat> so have a couple tables that you use. Um, I have a couple that are in the resources that you can pull on. The Agency Medical Directors Group for Washington, they have a really very comprehensive chronic pain guide tool, but I like their table a lot. Um, this is some of that numbers pulled from that. So just thinking, you know, if a patient says, you know, I, I, I took some lorazepam, or I took, sorry, I won't say that one, because that's a, that's a giveaway. Um, I had some, so, some cocaine, and, and I last used it a week ago, um, and the cocaine's positive today, ah, that doesn't really fit. If a patient is uh, getting prescribed buprenorphine from you and they said, oh, doc, I'm so sorry, I forgot my beep this morning, that's probably why it's negative. Well, that doesn't really make sense either. Um, so think about the timing of what you would expect to show positive with the timing of the patient's history and what you're thinking about. Does that, does that result make sense? Um, our next big pitfall in immunoassays is the common false positive. So medications that we are often prescribing to our patients or that um, you might have a consult that is prescribing for one of your patients that commonly show up positive, not 100% of the time, but commonly can show up positive, again, because of that George Cassandra squint thing, um, that things look similar enough to the immunoassay that it might show up positive. Um, so if you have a patient that's been very, very stable, and all of a sudden you start showing up positive for amphetamines out of nowhere, um, you get a good history, they're really adamantly denying, <clears throat> it's a good idea to take a look at their medication list and ask them about over-the-counter medications and supplements that they're, ta that they're taking as well. And think about, you know, is, is it likely that what they're getting over the counter or that you're also prescribing is showing up as this positive thing? Uh, the caveat there is don't assume automatically, oh, they're getting uh, labetalol and they're positive for amphetamines. It's cool. Um, really think about the clinical context. Think about whether or not you need to do confirmatory testing to make 100% sure that that substance is either in or not in their system. How uh, to think about. Um, one thing about amino assays, cocaine is highly, highly specific. It's cocaine, it's cocaine. Mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of false negatives, and this is probably the biggest pitfall that we run into. 
Um, so for our opiates, our opi line on our uh, immunoassays in clinic and our benzodiazepines, um, they don't detect all things within those class. So our opiate line does not detect all synthetic opioids. So specifically when you're looking for methadone or looking for buprenorphine or for oxys, you wanna make sure that your immunoassay has those specific medications, each one of them, those specific compounds separately on your immunoassay. If they're not on the immunoassay specifically, you're not testing for them. Um, fentanyl and tramadol are uh, typically not on immunoassay. They're really not uh, commercially available regularly. So if you're looking for those, if you're suspicious for those, you do have to send that off for GCMS, LCMS, to confirm that it's there. Benzodiazepines, this is the biggest pitfall by far we run into. So our standard immunoassay um, looks for nordiazepam or oxazepam, which is a metabolite of diazepam, chlorazepoxide, and temazepam. Alprazolam, razepam, and clonazepam, which I certainly see prescribed way more frequently in our local community here, all of them have their own specific individual um, metabolite that you need to look for in testing that the cross-reactivity of our standard clinical immunoassay doesn't detect. Um, so unless the patient is taking very large volumes or you just happen to catch them on the day that the squint gets it close enough, they're not gonna show up positive. So a patient that's getting prescribed clonazepam but shows negative on their immunoassay, they might actually be taking it. And that might be a reason to send off for confirmation testing to make sure that that is there. Um, but just remember that a negative benzodiazepine assay doesn't mean that they're not taking any one of these, one of those three medications. So when should we be sending confirmation? So huge point here is don't send confirmation if a patient confirms a positive result. If they initially tell you, oh, I didn't have any benzos in, in the last week, and the urine tox comes back positive for benzos, you bring it back and say, hey, Bill, there were benzos in your urine today. Any thoughts on where that might've come from? And they say, oh, well, you know, I did take a sleeping pill last night. That's probably what it was. Then they've already confirmed they've taken a benzo. There's no need to confirm that, um, that they've taken it because you have the history piece. Don't waste the money, don't waste the resource. Um, do consider if your prescribing or follow-up would change. So if that confirmation that a substance is, is or is not in their urine um, would change how frequently you see them, you would taper more frequently if you discontinue their medication, change the therapy, those are reasons to consider getting testing done. If it might have legal implications for a patient. So if they're involved in um, either some type of criminal case or their CPS investigation and having a positive test on their record would be something that's harmful if it were to be discovered through uh, court proceedings. Um, Clearing them by sending that negative test, um, even though like you have a very low clinical suspicion, might be good to have on the record on their behalf. Um, and to think about it, also if your timeline doesn't fit, thinking back to our table, and it would change your prescription uh, or follow-up plan. Um, what if you're not sure it's urine? So you've got your, your LA confidential press X to doubt option here. If you think it's not urine, there's a couple of things that we can do. A simple thing we can do in clinic is the temperature. Some urine collection samples actually have a thermometer built into them. Ours don't in our clinic. Um, and a lot of these things you're gonna actually have to send off to your lab, depending on what resources you have in your clinic, because the range um, that they're showing where it's gonna be really sort of outside the normal range that makes you think about it, adulteration, dilution, substitution, it's pretty far out there. So we don't have pH paper that goes to these higher low ranges. Uh, we can't run a creatinine clinic. Um, our spec rab doesn't go that lower high. So you'd have to send these off to the lab if you're really concerned that like maybe this isn't a real urine or it's been altered. The last little piece, I'm trying to talk as fast as I possibly can, uh, but this is really important. So I'm gonna take it. Oh, I'm good, I'm, I'm good. Um, this is great because I think this is, this is a really important thing. So when we talk about the language of our urine, I, I really wanna emphasize this. And I know that most folks in the community are getting, getting better about this is to avoid use of terms like dirty or, or clean and even being, being cautious with the term aberrant. Um, all of them have, have negative or positive connotations. And we really wanna to try to be as neutral as possible when we're talking about these outcomes. You know, when patient, our diabetic patient comes in and they've got glucose in their urine, they've got glucosuria. They don't have a dirty urine. So let's talk about the facts. What's actually going on? What are we dealing with? Um, the terms are also very unclear. Um, so someone that um, has a positive urine for benzodiazepines might be clean for one patient and might be dirty for another patient. So it's not helpful to say dirty or clean. It doesn't tell us anything about what's, what's going on. State the facts. Urine's positive for benzos, buprenorphine, methadone, negative for all others. Um, that tells you exactly what you need to know. Those are, those are the facts. Um, talking about expected versus unexpected results, I think it's very helpful. Um, and I don't remember which one of my colleagues was using the terms discordant or concordant with the history. Uh, both of those sort of tell you like, this is expected based on the prescription pattern and what the patient's telling us in their history versus not. That is helpful to think about and how we're then gonna make a decision about their care plan going forward. Um, so really shifting our language to think about these, these stigmatizing um, substance use disorder treatment and uh, use of chronic controlled substances. Key points to close with, have a system for when you're testing stick to it and be consistent in how you're um, responding to the outcomes for all of your patients. 
Um, think about the timing. Does it make sense with their history? Uh, be aware of your common false positives. Have a table that you can rely on. Screen a patient's medication list. See if it makes sense. That that, um, that thing that keeps showing up as positive despite uh, a really negative history, does it make sense that it's that diphenhydramine they're getting prescribed? Uh, know what you're not testing for, especially with benzodiazepines and opioids, um, and avoid confirmation testing unless it's going to change your management. Um, save that money. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and just move on to our next presenter. Uh, this is our headliner for the morning, uh, Dr. Ann Watson, who has a very stimulating talk about methamphetamine use disorder. <laughs> 